Okay, so my, uh, sorry about all of this. Uh, again, I'm Alan Silberberg. This is uh, Gov 2.0 LA. Um, if you're following on Twitter, it's Gov 20 LA is the hashtag. Uh, so I'm going to call my presentation the yin yang of Gov 2.0. And the reason I'm calling it that is because um, it's come really become very evident that the same tools that are being used to help people uh, get through crises, to help people pay their taxes online, to file business documents online, um, are also being used by governments around the world to harm people, um, to cause death, and to, to, to do a lot of things that aren't good. At the same time, there's also corporations that are doing the same thing. And so I think that we've now entered a phase where we all have to start asking questions about you know, what's actually going on here. And so I've identified basically three parts to the whole of this situation. And the situation as I see it is that um, everybody's very enthusiastic about the shiny new technologies. And they, they see something, they say, wow, this is something that's going to help our agency or our, our group or whatever it is function better or do something more efficiently. Um, but the, with the new comes the good and the bad. And so what I've, and you can't see it, so I'll show you. Um, this is what it is. It's, it's a funnel. And um, I think that the three things, good, new, and bad, are going all together in that funnel. And it really comes down to this. It comes down to how do you, people, use these tools? You know, how do we make the decision to do something that's good or make a decision to do something that's bad? But ultimately, these, these tools, which is what they are, social media, mobile, cloud, encryption, et cetera, they're just tools. It's like a hammer or, or a wrench. And if someone doesn't pick up the hammer or the wrench and use it, it's not going to get used. Well, some of these tools can be automated now. And you know, obviously, there's, there's a lot of companies and, and governments that are focused on using big data and, and computers in ways that are almost human-like. Um, but we're not quite there yet. There's still, you still need people to be involved. Uh, and, but then I came up with the number two, which is the bad use. And I'm going to hold up my computer here because this is truly interactive. Um, and I, I've identified it as basically cyber citizen tracking, okay, which r results in things like stolen identity, stolen money, stalking, death, prison. It just depends on which country you are. Um, and so I think that this is something that we all have to start paying attention to because, you know, at the same time that a government agency might put in a budget request for some tools and they're going to say, gee, we're going to use this for good. Um, well, who's to say that they're not using it for something else? At the same time, who's to say that there's people out there who have access to the same exact tools um, who may not be a government agency who might be trying to use it only for bad? Um, and so the, the, there's these lines now that are almost invisible. And um, I would say that, in fact, many of these lines have been crossed. That where it used to be you could identify who were the cyber criminals. You could identify you know, who was the bad guy. And now, basically, we're in this environment where the quote unquote bad guy um, can be anybody. They can be anywhere. You know, they could be 30 people at once um, replicating their IP address across the world. And you're sitting there trying to figure out who it is. But yet, they're still trying to access your, your your systems, or they're trying to hurt somebody, or in the real world situation, maybe you know taking it a step further and going after uh, uh, utilities, or you know going after something uh, uh, infrastructure level um, because somebody said, "Oh, gee, there's a computer hole that we can go after." Uh, and so, th the question goes back to again what I said, which is the decisions that people make about how these tools should be used and implemented. Uh, I personally believe that these tools should be used in a good way. Now, this slide is, uh, was taken right after Hurricane Sandy, and it shows Twitter, but it also shows on the, the left-hand side here, uh, everything is in French. And on this side, it's in English. And what they did is uh, somebody decided to collect various Twitter uh, handles that were being responsive to Hurricane Sandy and put them together on a single web page. And you know, clearly demonstrated here's the power of these things helping people in a very positive way. And I think that that's something that many government agencies and corporations start to really have to strive for right now, because there's this there, because we're at this point where the good, bad, the yin yang are so close to each other 
the, the, I think that basically governments and corporations have to make a, almost a conscious decision in a way to do the right thing. Um, to say we want our software to be used this way or, or only this way and we, we're not going to allow it to be cross used in some other way that we didn't design it for or what it, we don't want it to, to, to be allowed. However, we're not quite there yet. I think we're at a point now where you know, there's still, like I said, it's sort of the shiny new thing and so there's a rush to buy things, there's a rush to get to the cloud, there's a rush to, to BYOD, to, to bring, bring your own device. Um, and, and sometimes the rush to that also uh, kind of leaves people out in terms of, well, you know, what's going to happen with this? What's the actual outcome of this technology beyond what somebody is saying, here's what it, we promise it can do. Um, now, This is a picture of, uh, it's a commercial art that I found online. Um, it's basically depicting David versus Goliath. And in the background here is, you know, Goliath's soldiers and armies. Um, and I think that's where we are right now, is, is, is it's David versus Goliath, but it's David versus Goliath in the way that, uh, you know, the United States government might actually be David because Goliath is all these different players at all different times and you never really know who you're exactly going after and it's constantly changing and it's constantly you know, getting to a point of, well, who are we dealing with? Are we dealing with the Chinese? Are we dealing with the Russians? Are we dealing with five companies? Are we dealing with uh, you know, the, the Mexican cartels? Who is it? Who are the players here? And I think that the questions start to become, you know, again, when you look at the sort of the, the two sides of government 2.0, um, and you start to say, well, really, who is David here? Who's Goliath? Because 10 years ago, David would have been the quote unquote, the hacker would have been David taking on you know, the big societies, the big industries, and trying to go after the Defense Department or whatever. Um, but now, I think we're in a situation where uh, no one knows. And, and the problem is that the the bad people are just as adept, if not more so, at using these very same technologies as the people who are on the good side. And so there's this constant give and take. The, the, the problem is that the, the people who are on the bad side aren't bound by any rules. And so they are free to do things uh, using the very same technologies that, that maybe governments or corporations can't do. So this raises a very big question, which is, who is Big Brother? Uh, you know, and also a secondary question, which is basically, have we surpassed Orwell's wildest dreams? So who is Big Brother? Is it corporations? Is it, is it, big, is it big government agencies? Is it, is it you know, some sort of mysterious group that owns a bunch of servers somewhere, but you've never really heard of them, but yet they own all the servers? Or uh, you know, is it a computer? Is it man? I mean, who's controlling Big Brother now? I think this is really where we're at a point where, and we saw it this week with, with everything, you know, everybody was talking about, you know, the, the eye in the sky and, and how social media was being used to track and crowdsource. Um, but at the same time, there's some pretty hefty computers in the background trying to sift through all that data and sift through the keywords and the names and the places and the times. Um, but who's controlling all this? So, you know, when we're at a point now where if, if government 2.0, is has is these two sides to it, then then I think a really big ethical question has to be who's controlling this? Is it a computer? Is it a man? Is it is it something in between? Um, <laughs> and 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 if so, where are the boundaries there? And and what are the boundaries that are being created by by us as society? And what are the boundaries that are created technically? Uh, I'm originally from Philadelphia. And so this is a photograph of Independence Hall in Philadelphia. I took it with my mobile phone. It's a kind of a blurry photograph, so maybe it's good that it's not up on the big screen. Um, I took it because I think that this is where we're, we're at a very important part of our historical transition right now, which is, you know, 250 years ago, 240 years ago, if you wanted to be part of the Continental Congress and, and uh, try to affect the change that was going on, you had to be a rich man, a rich white man, actually. And you had to be in the room. You had to be in the room. You had to be in this hot little you know, brick building in July in Philadelphia. And if you weren't in the room, 
didn't matter. Didn't matter if you're rich, didn't matter if you're poor, your, your, your voice simply wasn't being heard. Now, it's your mobile phone. Your mobile phone is the modern day equivalent for all of us of addressing the content of the Congress. Um, with your mobile phone, you can reach the world. Now, uh, with my phone, with this, you know, with this phone right here, I could, standing right here, if I wanted to, I could tweet, I could, I could actually start a live Skype conversation, um, you know, I could get on Google+, Plus. Um, I could probably reach tens of thousands of people separate from the live stream simply by my mobile phone. Um, and uh, I may or may not have something to say. <laughs> Um, but all of us collectively now have this power, which is essentially, you can essentially address the equivalent of the Continental Congress. You, you can address your peers. You can address the media, the, the powers that be, with your phone. You could stand on the proverbial soapbox on a corner, but now it's a digital soapbox. And it's not a corner, it's wherever you happen to be at that moment. Uh, and I think that this is a really critical time. So do you have an idea? You want you want to brainstorm something? Tweet it, put it out there, see what happens. You know, suddenly you'll start getting some responses. People might call you dumb. They might say that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. But you're getting some free, uh, you know, crowdsourced information on your idea, like whether you like what you hear or not. Uh, if you want to organize, you know, go on Facebook and start using the various tools that Facebook has and and the ways that it connects people and their friends and the social graph and and organize and use the calendars and the events and, and you, you know, do things to actually take action. Mm, take it a step further, um, if you're in a country like Syria and you're trying to you know, overthrow your totalitarian government, um, well, I have one word, encryption. And, and you know, if you want to try to stay safe and keep your family safe and, and, and do something, well, you have to rely on encryption. Um, and so we're at these stages now where you can go from basically on a smartphone like this, uh, I could both simultaneously do something publicly on Twitter, on Facebook, Google+, et cetera, and two seconds later, I could send an encrypted email and nobody would ever know the difference from right here. And uh, I, I just, I'm just an average person. So all of us now have the same power. And I think it's very important for all of us to recognize that you know, we do have this power. And it's sort of, I think we've seen it this week, unfortunately, you saw how people, how average people were drawn into the horrific events happening in Boston and happening in Texas. Um, and in Washington, in fact, where buildings were being evacuated and whatnot. But you also saw regular people helping each other through social media with their updates, with their pushes. You know, I'm at Foursquare, I'm, where, I'm here, I'm safe. Don't worry, don't have to call me. You know, I think that we, we've seen a major transition. You know, in, in the old days, when there was an emergency, phone lines pretty much melted down because everybody was on the phone, like, are you okay, are you okay, are you okay? <laughs> and now, you know, it's just sort of, like, hey, I'm fine, don't bother, you know, I'm on Facebook, whatever it is. But more importantly, I think that we, we collectively as a nation, as a world, social media allowed us to share something, share a tragedy together uh, in real time um, and mourn in real time together. Uh, whether or not you were in Boston or whether or not you had pictures or you didn't have pictures or but it still allowed us to share the same things and to learn about you know the family members of people who were killed or hurt um, and to, to read and share uh, collectively as a nation as a world maybe for the first time kind of the, the real-time impact of, of what a disaster means of what a crisis means to, to individuals to families to people to governments um, so I think that this week again, has just been tremendous in, in so many different levels, sadly tremendous on so many different levels. Um, and so I go back to what I said about shiny and new. Uh, I think that, you know, this is, this is an image of, of a, you know, just data basically going through a large data center. Uh, what works wonders for governments is doing good and helping people simultaneously, um, without any change, can be used uh, in extremely dangerous and um, deadly real life and real time ways. And I think that it goes, really comes down to a major question for government 2.0, government 3.0 moving forward. Uh, the question is, how, do, how are these tools being used? Who's using them? What decisions are being made to either hurt people or protect people? And then, and then I think secondarily, you know, as a society, what sorts of controls 
can we start to demand um, that we have some sort of protections, whether they be anti-stalking or, or, or anti-harassment or some, you know, how do we apply the same sorts of laws that apply in quote unquote real life um, onto the online life? Because now I don't believe there's a crossover. The online life has reached into the real world in such a way that I don't think you can ever take it away. And so it really comes down to all of us. I think the, the very basic questions. Uh, so there's all these fancy, shiny tools. Are you going to use it for good or are you going to use it for bad? Um, so with that, I want to say uh, we have some tremendous speakers today. In the next uh, few minutes, you're going to hear from Peter Biddle, who is the general manager of cloud services for the Intel Corporation and has a, a few things on his mind, uh, from what I understand. And uh, on Twitter, the hashtag is GOV20LAGOV20LA. And so feel free to use Twitter to send us questions. We'll be monitoring it throughout the day. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was. <laughs> um, and then, so Pete Peterson's suggestion, who's our one of our hosts here at Pepperdine. Thank you, Pete. Uh, we're going to take a five minute break. We will be back. Uh, we'll start our live stream again at nine o'clock. Um, so, a seven minute break. Thank you very much. <laughs>